Good morning. Let's call one another to worship with words in books and on the screen. Let all people hear the wisdom of God. All are equal in the sight of God. Let the wise and foolish hear God's wisdom. All are equal in the sight of God. Let the rich and the poor hear God's wisdom. All are equal in the sight of God. God's love extends to all for all eternity. Our lives find their meaning in the love of God. Let's remain standing as you're able and sing for him, the King of love my shepherd is. Let's all come before God in prayer. We come and bow before you, our King of love. Although all might and power and majesty are yours, yet it is your love that shines the brightest, your love shown in creating a beautiful world, full of good things, your love in providing food for us to enjoy, water to drink and live, the warmth of the sun, the beauty of nature, the love, friendship and companionship of our fellow humans. Your love for us, in that although we have spoilt the beauty of creation, Although we have held back food from our fellow humans, and although we have allowed wars, strife, selfishness and greed to spoil our relationships, 
yet your love remains steadfast. Your love showing in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. He showed us how to live, and he died that we might live. As we see such love, such kindness, and such patience, we realise how little of that love we have in our hearts. How easily we can be angry, impatient, or unkind. How easy it is to be selfish, even with those we love most. Lord God, this morning, be merciful to forgive us. Cleanse our hearts and renewing us a right and loving spirit. Help each one of us to encounter your love today. Help us as we sing of that love, read of that love, hear of that love, and help each one of us to go forth from here, filled afresh with that love, to serve and love the world giving all glory to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And so let's join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, it's good to see those of you who are here with us in the church. Uh, welcome to you, whether it's your thousandth time here or your first time here. It's very good to be together. And welcome to those of you joining online. Now, we, we are still having some internet problems here. Internet was restored, but it's been restored in a rather shaky fashion. So we're once again tethering off the phone. So this means that if you're watching online, I'm afraid there's just one camera because uh, a phone cannot cope with all the cameras and all the facilities we normally have. We're sorry for that, but you should be able to hear everyone joining in and see some of us at least. We, uh, during the service, we have um, Solomon taking part, who will be doing reading, readings for us. Tommaso will be leading us in our prayers, and Tommaso, Jeff, and Alberto will be uh, heading our panel discussion. My name's Nigel and I will be leading a service and Simon will come and bring God's word to us later. Now, Monday Thursday is coming up. It sounds far too far away, I know, but it's only on the 6th of April, which I think means it's three weeks. I should have counted this up. I think that means it's three weeks this coming Thursday. And on Monday, Thursday, we're going to join together with the Crown Court Church of Scotland, just down the road here, and have a, a meal and communion. And they say it's for the English, Welsh, and Scottish churches. So it's a proper union of churches. I don't quite know what happened to the Irish. I don't, maybe there's not an Irish church around here. Who knows? But anyway, yeah, it's on Monday, Thursday at 7 p.m. at the, the Church of Scotland down the road. And I've got a sign-up sheet here, so please, if you're able to come, sign up. They'd like to know how many to prepare meals for, and you can sign up this sheet. If you're watching online and you think, well, yes, I'll be able to go to that, then drop us an email or something to Simon, and he'll get you signed up as well. So we'll have this out over the next few weeks, but please do sign up and come along. It's always a good, good time. I remember last year joining in together with, with the Scottish Church here for communion. And it was really, we were still sort of quite new in having services. And it was rather wonderful all to be together on that occasion. So remember that, Maundy Thursday, 6th of April. Now let's take a moment to pray and recognise our giving to God and the church. Lord God, all that we have comes from you. We pray for the giving to the church for the giving of money, that you might use it for your glory, that you might direct 
the thoughts of those who have to decide what is done with it. May it build your kingdom here in Bloomsbury and in London. We pray also that we might freely give of our time, our talents and our energies. May all be done for your glory. Amen. And now the choir are going to bring an anthem for us, uh, a Lenten hymn, or ye that pass by to Jesus draw nigh. And now Solomon, from the, the depths of snowy northern England, is going to bring our first reading to us. Thank you, Nigel. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 1 to 9. Praise for deliverance from oppression. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of foreigners is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you, 
for you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the roofless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of foreigners, like heat in a dry place, you subdue the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the roofless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines, stream clear. And he would destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the covering that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, See, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the law for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let's stand once again and sing a hymn. Here in this place, new light is streaming. Now it is the darkness vanished. And now Solomon's going to bring us our second reading. And after that, Simon will then come and bring us a message today. 
Our second scripture reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. The parable of the wedding banquet. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves saying, fare those who have been invited. Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat cows have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them and killed them, the king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe, and he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without the wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him, hand, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Well, I don't know what sermon you were expecting to hear on this passage this morning, but possibly it might have gone something like this. God's kingdom is like a wedding banquet, which he is throwing for his son, Jesus. Those whom he first invited, uh, the oh-so-religious and pious Jews, have declined to attend and have even killed the messengers that God has sent to invite them. So God has sent his messengers, messengers into the highways and byways of the world to invite everyone else to the party instead. From tax collectors to prostitutes, from riffraff to nobodies, from the blind and to the lame, God drags into his party all the people who thought they'd been forgotten. However, whilst God may have invited everybody, this isn't a no strings attached invitation because whilst God loves everybody, he doesn't want them to stay as they are. After all, who would want the serial killer to get in without modifying her behavior? The invitation might be for all, but people must still accept it and must behave appropriately if they are to stay in the party. So a person who comes, metaphorically speaking, wearing the wrong clothes, who doesn't clothe themselves with garments of love, justice, truth, mercy, and holiness, is in effect saying they don't want to stay at the party, and so they are thrown out into the outer darkness. There we go. That's the sermon I've heard preached on this passage before. It's the sermon that has the established weight of interpretive scholarship behind it. And I think, frankly, it's a terrible sermon. Because let's think for a moment about where this sermon takes us, if we follow it through to its logical conclusion. Let's start with the king, the one who is focused on throwing a wedding banquet for his son. What do we know about the king from the parable? Well, to start with, He's pathologically obsessed with giving his son a magnificent party. It doesn't seem to matter to him, really, who the guests are, just as long as the party is good. He also keeps some very dubious company. Let's not forget that his preferred guests for the party 
are themselves hardly the nicest of people. They are, we are told, arrogant, landowning businessmen with a tendency towards murderous violence. The king is also, we know, a military man of means. We know that he has slaves and that he has troops and that he is ready to use this power to its full capacity. So he thinks nothing of putting to death anyone who slights him and he's happy to send in the troops to burn an entire city to the ground if they don't give him the respect to which he believes himself entitled. He is, in short, a military, self-aggrandizing, capricious, despotic dictator. He looks very much like Herodian family, the Herods of the first century. Or maybe, maybe he looks a bit like some of the more psychotic of the Roman emperors of the first century. What he doesn't look like, if we're honest about it, is God. Or perhaps he does look like God. If you've got an image of God as a military, self-aggrandizing, capricious, despotic dictator, which is, of course, exactly how quite a lot of people do exactly picture God. There are many who believe that God is just waiting to catch them out, to throw them out, to cast them into the place of outer darkness where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. There are many who believe that God's gracious inclusion only goes so far and that if we don't respond appropriately, we'll find ourselves on the receiving end of his sacred divine wrath and violence levied on us as judgment along with the rest of the sinners. But I want to suggest something in the way we might interpret this parable from Jesus, which may by now seem obvious. I don't think in this parable that the king is God. An awful lot of sermons have preached it as such, but what if this king is not God? So I'm going to suggest we try to set aside the sermon we thought we might get on this passage and we try to put out of our minds the sermons that we've heard on this parable before. And maybe by reading it afresh, we may see what will emerge from it if we allow ourselves to read it and hear it a bit differently. What if the king in Jesus' parable isn't God? What if the king's son in this parable isn't Jesus? What if the first invited guests aren't the Jews? What if the forced in guests aren't grateful to be there? What if the man with the wrong clothes on isn't a sinner deserving of his fate? What if people have been reading this parable wrong all these years because they have been reading it through the lens of a wrong view of God. What if God isn't a violent dictator after all? Let's try and hear the parable as those listening to Jesus in the first century may have heard it. There was a king who had a son, said Jesus, and his hearers would have already been nodding along. Wasn't there just? we can almost hear them thinking. Herod the Great had been appointed ruler of Judea by the Romans some 70 years earlier. And after a reign of nearly half that, he had died and handed over the kingdom to his descendants, the Herodian dynasty as they have become known. Through a careful series of strategic marriages, he and his descendants had ensured that they were able to continue their despotic rule of Israel for generations. And there's nothing like a royal wedding to reunite the population behind the fading appeal of an aging monarch, is there? 
After all, royal weddings, as we all know, lead to royal babies, and so fresh life is breathed into the tired old family firm, and everyone's won over for another generation, and then in due course you get another coronation, and everybody loves them again. I am talking about the first century Herodians. You do know that, don't you? That's the theory. At least, well, maybe some of us are not so easily seduced, but that's another story. The Herodians had been ruling Judea for generations. Their power base carefully propped up by these strategic alliances and marriages, supported by the world-class Roman military, legitimated by a string of propaganda exercises designed to keep the people happy. When somebody tells a parable, in about 32, 33 CE and begins, there was a king who had a son. We all know he's talking about Herod and Herod's sons and nephews and grandchildren. What's interesting then in Jesus's story is that the invited guests to the latest big royal event choose not to attend. We know what kind of people they are. They're exactly the kind of people who you'd expect to find at a Herodian wedding. One of them owns a farm. Another one is a successful businessman. They're the elite. And they're not coming to the king's party. They've made their excuses. They're turning against this king. Perhaps his popularity is starting to run out. Perhaps it's time for a change as his supporters are distancing themselves strategically from the royal palace. After all, there's always a pretender in, to the throne waiting in the wings if the current incumbent oversteps the mark. So the king pushes back a bit harder. And then they push back a bit further and they seize the king's slaves and kill them. My goodness think those listening to this parable. It's insurrection time. Civil war is only moments away now in this story. So the king pushes back even harder and he sends in his crack troops to utterly destroy those who have defied him, burning their city to the ground. Kings like Herod and those who came after him cannot have this kind of behavior on their watch. This is a response worthy of any dictator in any age. You could write this king's response onto Putin today. But from the king's perspective, there's still a party to have. You can't let the cracks show. You can't let the facade slip. There's a succession to a secure. There's a population to be wowed with wedding cake and bunting in the streets and God help anyone else who decides that it's time to stop playing the monarchist. Come on in, come to the feast and don't you dare say that you've got somewhere else to be on that Saturday in May. This is political royalist propaganda at its most biblically blatant. And of course the people play ball. I mean, you know, who wouldn't? Everyone loves a royal event if they know what's good for them. Except, of course, for the one who doesn't play ball at all. He's there, along with everyone else who's been forced to the party. But he's not joining in. He's wearing the wrong clothes. He's silent when he should be singing. He's still when he should be shouting. He's the party pooper, the one who makes everyone else feel a bit uncomfortable because he's showing their forced jollity for what it is, a lie inspired by fear. The kingdom of heaven is like this, says Jesus, introducing the parable. And we may well now ask, in what way is this story like the kingdom of heaven? After all, we've just established that the kingdom of heaven is not the banquet. This king is not God. 
This is a very earthly story, one very familiar, not just to those hearing it from Jesus, but to those in any generation who have looked on their ruling elite and seen self-interest and violent corruption. Where in this parable, where in this story, can the kingdom of God be found? Well, the kingdom of heaven, as we know from some of Jesus' other parables, is not always to be found in the place one might at first expect. Sometimes it's a mustard seed, small, almost invisible, fragile, waiting to be discovered in the most unexpected of places. And I think the kingdom of God is there in this parable. We just need to go looking for it a bit harder. When faced with a murderous regime or a despicable dictator, this parable points to three possible responses. The first path taken by the initial guests, the first invited, the businessman, the landowner, the farm owner. And this is the response that plays the political game which seeks to effect regime change and will resort to violence if necessary. The tactical distancing, the killing of the servants. The problem, of course, with this is that it's not only, uh, it's not only that it's a high-risk strategy, as the landowning businessman in Jesus' story discovered to his cost, but even if it is effective, you only end up, in the end, replacing one Herod with another. And so nothing really changes. This is the path, though, that will most readily appeal to those with a vested interest in the status quo. To those who have previously been cozying up to the old dictator, diligently attending all of his previous parties, right up until the moment when the wind of change started to blow against him, at which point it's time to realign, to distance, maybe to usher in the next generation of Herod, just to see if he's any better. Of course, he won't be. That's the first response, the first guests. The second response is that taken by those who do end up attending the feast that's been thrown by the king. And this one I'm calling the path of least resistance. It's the path that says, yeah, I know he's a dictator, but what are you going to do? It's the path that says, yeah, I know they're awful, but if we'd elected the other party, would they actually have been any better? It's the path taken by those who feel disempowered, by those who live in fear or apathy or both who just wants to be left alone and allowed to live their quiet lives. If others are going to take a stand and die for their trouble, well, that's very sad, <clears throat> but we at least are going to survive another night. And really, is there anything so wrong with a bit of partying on demand? An extra bank holiday weekend so we can all enjoy the monarchy, even if it does represent capitulation to state violent propaganda. That's the second response. Those who just come because they're told and join in because, well, what are you going to do? And then there is a third response. <clears throat> this is taken by the man in the corner, the one who's wearing the wrong clothes. In a world of violence and enforced capitulation, he stands out. This, surely, is the kingdom of heaven personified. This is the kingdom of heaven as the suffering servant, the one who remains silent before his accusers and goes to his death in defiance of the forces that seek continued and unfettered reign to diminish, distort, and demean humanity. In the world of the prophetic book of Isaiah, which we had our first reading from, written some 600 or so years before the time of Jesus, 
we find the prophet speaking to a time of military occupation and enforced exile at the hands of the Babylonian Empire. We find the origins of this suffering servant counter-testimony to the ideology of big empire. The Babylonians, you see, had declared that the world must bow down before them or else face terrible consequences. The Babylonians had issued their own invitation to their propaganda feast. And anybody who declined to turn up, well, they just sent in the armies and invaded and took people into exile and forced them to come. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians, had declared that all the world must worship him and him alone. And most of the world did, because, well, what are you going to do? And it was in the midst of this world, 600 years before the time of Jesus, that prophet Isaiah started to articulate a dream. A dream of a new world. He didn't quite say, I have a dream. But he pretty much did. In the midst of oppression, Isaiah wrote a dream of a hopeful future. Of a time and a place where tears would be wiped away and people would be free to feast with their God in joyful celebration of their liberty from subjugation. The kingdom banquet dreamed of by Isaiah is a world away from the wedding banquet of the king in Jesus' parable. But there is a common thread, and it's this figure of a suffering servant. The insight of the prophet Isaiah was that the new world of justice and equality that he was dreaming of would only come into being in the world through the suffering of the innocent, those who take their stand in defiance of the inequalities and violence that otherwise dominate the world. So Isaiah personifies the nation of Israel as the faithful servant of the Lord. The one who is wounded and marred and killed for the sake of the new world that is coming into being. And in Isaiah's time, the suffering servant passage is clearly referring to the sufferings of the nation of Israel at the hands of the Babylonian oppressors. Because who was it who resisted the Babylonian propaganda feast? Well, it was the faithful Jewish people of God who would not bow down and worship Nebuchadnezzar and paid a terrible price for their resistance. And of course, the New Testament writers used this same ancient image of suffering servant which they borrowed from Isaiah, and they used it to describe what they saw in Jesus, who went to his cross to take upon himself the violence of humanity, opening the way through death to resurrection and new life for all. And it is this figure of the suffering servant that I think we meet standing in the corner of Jesus' own story of a propaganda banquet. This is the silent man who refuses to put on the appropriate garments of celebration for the royal feast. And so he is seized by the king's attendants and bound like a sacrificial victim and thrown into the outer darkness to die. This is the crucial moment in this parable. And I think it is here that the kingdom of heaven comes most clearly into view. The guests at the banquet in the parable are in all sorts of trouble. They live in a world of violence and fear. They're asked to accept propaganda that legitimates their own oppression and coercion, and they are in no position to challenge the king, because those who have already tried are now dead with their city burned to the ground. The guests at the king's banquet in this parable are people with no hope. And it is to those who live in the land of deep darkness 
that the unrobed man comes. Standing in their midst, one of them yet not one of them, with them but not the same as them. And he takes onto himself the wrath of the king. He becomes the sacrificial victim. He interrupts their victimhood by making himself the victim for all. This is the kingdom of heaven. This is Jesus. This is the suffering servant. So what about us? We, like the prisoner guests of the tyrannical king, we also live in a world of great violence, do we not, my friends? There is horror being played out before our eyes in Palestine and Ukraine and in South Sudan and in so many other places. And our leaders don't know how to respond except by trying to bring about peace by ramping up the violence, which just perpetuates it to another generation, deferring it for another year. What did we think was going to happen when we armed the Taliban in Afghanistan? And we might well ask, in the midst of the complexities of war and suffering, where is the kingdom of heaven? Where is the counter-testimony to the dominant ideologies of retaliation and compliance? Where is the kingdom when those who were once our friends are now our enemies? Where is the kingdom when those who were once our enemies are now our friends? Where is truth and justice and righteousness and forgiveness and peace in a world of terrorism, war and bloody murder? Where are those who are taking a stand? Where are those who will not bow to the king? Where are those who will not comply? Let me tell you about my friend Simon. Some of you know Simon Hill. He worships here at Bloomsbury occasionally. He's a deacon at New Baptist Church in Oxford. As he was leaving a prayer meeting some while ago, uh, he realized that Oxford Town Centre was at a standstill. And he sort of stood there in silence listening to some stuff and said, what's going on? And somebody said, well, they're, they're about to proclaim Charles as king. And Simon waited, and he waited respectfully whilst they, went through, uh, whilst they went through the morning for the late queen. And then he waited whilst they proclaimed Charles king. And then once he decided, once only, to say what he thought. And he said loudly, I didn't vote for him. Now, you may or may not agree with him doing that. But that was the moment of quiet resistance. He said it once, and he said it peacefully. He was then arrested, handcuffed, put in the back of a police van and taken to the police station, where he was then told that he had been arrested under the law that prohibits um, protest that came in last year. You're not allowed to register protest in this country if it might give offence to somebody else. He was then de-arrested and then re-arrested a few weeks later and was sent to trial and it was only as it was about to go to trial that it was thrown out. In a small way, he took a stand for a different world that he believed in. You may or may not believe in that same world. But he took his stand. And I just wonder, in our world, let's, let's decouple the king from, from Charles for a moment. Let's imagine the king as a representative of the ideologies that oppress and distort and demean humanity. Let's imagine this king as whatever Herod looks like in our world, whatever the forces of Babylon look like in our world. Let's imagine this king as Putin or the Taliban or whatever warlord it is that you want to write this king onto in your mind. And there are plenty. Where are those who are taking a stand? Where are those who will not bow to the king? Where are those who will not comply? Where in the midst of the spirals of violence that define our world is the kingdom of heaven 
to be found. Where in a world of dictators and despots, of ideology and propaganda, where is the kingdom of heaven to be found? There are many Christians in so many places around our world who have taken their stand with the suffering servant, who have stood with the quiet man wearing the wrong clothes at the wedding banquet that they have been forced to attend. And they bear the marks of suffering in their body for their refusal to join the capitulation of dominant ideology. There are many Christians who are persecuted today for taking a stand for their faith. And in doing so, they bear faithful testimony, sometimes even unto death, for their refusal to be conformed to the demands of this world. They are refusing to be intimidated by the violence of the king, refusing to bow down to the systems of domination that seems to control, holding fast to the cross of Christ. And I think Jesus might ask of us, where will we be found? standing at the king's banquet or maybe to put it another way where are we going to take our stand thank you simon and as we take a minute to Reflect on that, I'll call the, the panellists to come forward and we'll have a, a short discussion on some of the things we've heard. So let's just take a minute to reflect. Okay, so I'm joined by Jeff to come on up and Alberto and Tommaso's online. I, w I wondered when I read this passage where Simon was going to take this, this passage. We really like to be members of a club that other people aren't members of. If you fly, you, you, you're at the airport, you're waiting to board at your gate and they say, thank you for flying you know, British Airways. We now welcome members of our gold club and first class club holders to come forward and you see people going forward and you sit there and wait. We welcome silver members and, and all these different tiers of people and, and I always think I'm right at the bottom tier here. I'm going to be called up at the very end with all the crowds and there's going to be no room for my suitcase and I shan't be greeted with champagne and, and I'm not a member of this club. We like being members of an exclusive club. People like being at a feast everyone can't get to. We, um, for many people, being part as they see it of the kingdom of God, partly rest joy of who isn't included and who isn't allowed into the kingdom of God. Being, being part of this country for some seems to rest on the fact that other people are not allowed to get, be here and not allowed to come here. For some people, being married means that we enjoy being married and we don't like the rules about marriage being widened to include others because that takes away from our exclusivity. So it's much more appealing to be part of, of a, a group of people excluding others than to be the person who is excluded, to be the person in the corner. And I, I think there's a challenge in what Simon said here. You know, who, who wants to be really, if you're honest, who wants to be that man who was excluded? But that, I think, is the calling that we have. Okay, then. So let's, let, let's hear from our panellists. Um, Alberto, come on up and share with us your thoughts. Sure. Uh, well, I, well, I mean, I, first of all, thanks to Simon. I really like the sermon today. Um, I think, I mean, first of all, I think the message is, is a very powerful one. Uh, I think it's really important to bring out this, one could almost say, political element in, in what Jesus did and, and preached. Uh, it's always important to bear in mind that part of what Jesus come to, came to do was bring this new humanity, bring this new renewal of what we are and what we 
do in our time on this earth. And so it's good to have this um, messages that kind of elaborate on what that looks like in particular contexts. I think it's, it's really good. Um, it also, uh, I also found interesting uh, the new interpretation that he brought forward, uh, just at the level of biblical interpretation. Um, I remember reading all the commentators talk about this parable and being puzzled about how this last part of the third man just doesn't seem to fit very well with the previous part in the traditional interpretation. And so some elaborate some very complicated stories about some editorial process. Um, so I really like the fact that it kind of ties in together all the parts of the parable uh, very neatly. Um, I also find it uh, interesting that, and I admit that it, the interpretation brings to me, to my mind, some other questions. Uh, which I'm very excited to explore later, which is um, one of them, for instance, is that this parable in the narrative of Matthew comes after two other parables that seem very deeply connected. Uh, and that at the first read, it seems that the two parables are quite a direct attack to the religious leaders of the time. So I would be interested in seeing how this interpretation of this third parable kind of has the possibilities of shedding new light on the other two that come before that. Um, I'd also like to know more, I guess, um, about the, the, this funny expression that appears in the end, right? The, the weeping and, and the gnashing of the teeth. Because um, we know that that appears elsewhere in Matthew, and that's not dropped there accidentally. It always has a very particular meaning. So I would also like to extend this interpretation somehow to the other instances where it appears. I think it can be interesting. Uh, but I don't say anything, any of this to undermine anything of what it's been said, but rather to emphasize how Jesus' parables are just, ha have this infinite richness with them. I really like something that uh, Rachel Rule says concerning this word mystery. Like, uh, he says that a mystery is not something that is, cannot be known, but rather is something that is endlessly knowable. It's something that you can come back one time and time again and learn more about it. And I think with Jesus' parables, this is what keeps happening. And so I, um, I really enjoyed the sermon because I feel that it really deeply enriched my understanding of, of this parable. So, Thank you. Uh, Jeff, do you want to yeah. share? This is uh, a development of a, a sermon that Simon preached uh, it's a development of a sermon that Simon preached a decade, maybe 15 years ago, I can't remember how far back. And it's one of the sermons that I remember. You know, sometimes, you know, preachers are probably disappointed in the fact that we don't always remember sermons. But um, that one remem I remember, and it changed the way I look at the Bible. So I really appreciated this one. I think Jesus walks a political tightrope um, in terms of how much he can offend his audience and how they will respond. So you see this most often, I think, in uh, questions on taxation, uh, where he walks a very political tightrope in how he answers them. But what happens with this one is I think his audience the scribes and the Pharisees, they might go to the suffering servant message. But the one that stands out to me is I think that the audience that's not of that nature will have gone to John the Baptist. He's the guy in the dodgy clothing. Thanks. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? Um, it's important, isn't it, sometimes to turn around what we think, um, particularly with the parables. I used to think, oh, you know, the easy things are the parables, you know, there's lots of scripture that's really hard to understand, but the parables, they're nice and simple and easy. We use them in Sunday schools because you can have pictures, and, and actually most of them require a lot of thinking and have been really misinterpreted. I think that's, that's helpful. I think, yeah, John the Baptist. I like John the Baptist. Simon's putting his thumbs up. He does too. 
See, this is why we're a Baptist church. He wasn't John the Presbyterian. No, 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 I mustn't say that. Tommaso, please rescue me. Thank you, Nigel, and thank you to the other panelists as well for their very thoughtful remarks. Um, I can only echo what has already been said about inclusion and exclusion. The, 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 the sermon made me think about different ways of being Christian and experiencing Christianity. On the one hand, there is this deeply human impulse to see oneself on the side of the angels, so to speak, and to go to church to find confirmation of our righteousness while keeping others out. And on the other hand, there is the attitude that Simon so powerfully outlined uh, towards the end in the third response. And the big challenge, as far as I'm concerned, is to find the strength to constantly raise questions about ourselves, our conduct, our beliefs, so to avoid sliding into uh, the first type of religiousness, which is perhaps the easiest one. Thank you. Yeah, I wonder if the easiest one is the path of least resistance, actually, because I sort of sat there thinking, oh, I'm a least resistance type guy. I don't like conflict. I don't like difficulty. I go along with things that I'm not entirely happy with because it just makes my life easier sometimes. But yes, thank you. Thank you, panel. Thank you. And, you know, let's chew these things over. Um, you have an excellent opportunity to talk these things over, over coffee. There's coffee, there's biscuits, there's even free fair trade chocolate. I mean, wow, left over from last week. So, you know, let's continue mulling these things over. Okay, so I think we're back to Tommaso. No, no, no we're not. No, 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 no. So we're going to have a third hymn, uh, Heaven Shall Not Wait for the Poor to Lose Their Patience. Now, the, the tune is not that well known, but it is quite easy to pick up. So Philip's going to play the through, tune through once, just so you can hear it and get the hang of it. And then we'll all sing together. But the choir are also going to sort of stand up there so that when we're all singing together, they can belt it out and you can, you can hear them and follow them if they get it right. So thank you, Philip.
just sing our prayers. Let us pray. Loving and merciful God, we express gratitude this morning for being blessed by your presence and for the companionship of those whose generosity, fortitude, and candor helped us connect with you. Those who welcomed us when we were strangers, shored us up when we were feeble, and let us experience your boundless love when we were hesitant, diffident, or even stricken by fear. Those friends have been a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, and an instrument of yours. We shall never forget. In setting out our aspirations, hopes, and concerns today, no matter our weaknesses and failings, we acknowledge the abundant gifts, talents, and richness we partake, and thus renew our commitment to share those resources with our brothers and sisters in need. By letting them sit at the banquet, refusing to cast them into outer darkness. May we be able to prove ourselves up to the task. Ours is not the power that excludes. Ours is not the power that divides. Ours is not the power that destroys. Loving and merciful God, may we be reminded that decent and honorable men and women, citizens who are law-abiding, who care about the future of humankind, who are upright and supportive of their neighbors, may nonetheless profit and unduly benefit from unjust norms that are deeply entrenched in our political, social, and economic order. May we be aware of that paradox, and may we find creative ways to tackle at least some of the inequities we may have created or contributed to perpetuate over time. May we sense the danger, as it has been said, of affirming your existence with our lips while denying it with our lives. Loving and merciful God, may we recognize that the ultimate source of our freedom lies not in our flesh, but in our soul. In a world wherein affluence is too often taken as an indicator of character and fulfillment, where success is too often associated with the idea of crushing one's competitors or one's opponents, rather than to the capacity to solve common problems, may we admit that your path is not always easy to detect or follow, that we may drift away from time to time, but also remember that there is an intimate delight and a unique beauty in hearing and drawing strength from your words whenever we can. We seek a life of joy, we seek a life of service, we seek a meaningful life, and also for this today we pray. <laughs>